If you have your Bibles, I want to turn with me this evening to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll be reading just a few verses. The words will also be on the screen this evening. Paul writes these words, 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of God for the people of God. The day was over and the evening was, was quite pleasant, but it wasn't the weather that had him in such a good mood. Tonight was the night they would gather and they would celebrate. He, he made his way through the city streets of Corinth to the home of their hosts, a very spacious home by Corinthian standards. That was why they met there, because as the group had grown, they needed, needed more space to be able to, to be together, all of them in the same spot. This home was perfect for that. Most of the group could gather in the central courtyard, which was partially open to the sky, and, and others would spill out into the surrounding rooms. As he made his way to the home, he, he saw others he knew arriving, some coming from the baths, some coming from the market, some coming from work as he was. No matter what their place in life, they came together this night on equal footing. Everyone was welcome, everyone was included. This was the night when they worshiped and celebrated the meal. Everyone brought dinner to share, and if someone couldn't bring food, they were still welcome to come and to, to share the meal. Some of the brothers and sisters simply didn't have the resources. They could barely feed themselves many days. But on this night, they all ate together. And then someone would get out the instruments and they would begin to sing. Somebody would share a story about how Jesus had touched their life. And then someone else would repeat an ancient scripture or they would, or they would sing one of David's psalms. And then the leader would share a bit about how the scripture they had read found its fulfillment in Jesus. One or two more people might share a story or a message they believed they had received from the Lord. And then, and then the most important time came. The leader for the evening would stand and say, we, we mustn't go away without recalling what Jesus did to make us his people. So let us then do as he did, take the bread and the cup, remember what he said and what he did, and then go from this place to serve him faithfully. And the bread would be passed, and then the cup, and all would partake. And after a blessing, they would all depart into the cool night air, determined to serve Jesus just a little bit better the next day. At least that's how it might have gone from what we know of the early church's worship habits. They gathered at homes, and every time they gathered, they remembered this night that in Jewish custom includes the question, how is this night different from all other nights? The Passover celebration was and, and is a remembrance of God rescuing the people from slavery in Egypt. In our communion celebration, we remember how God rescued us from slavery to sin and that he did that through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. This night is a night meant for community, for celebration, for communion with Christ and with one another. This night we remember, as Jesus told us to do. In the short passage we read this evening from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we have the earliest account written down of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the, and we have the earliest written down words of Jesus. This letter predates the Gospels being written by 10 to 15 years. Paul says he received this tradition from the Lord. Now that could mean he got a vision from Jesus. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It probably means this tradition was handed down to him, maybe from many sources, but that he knows it goes all the way back to what happened in that upper room originally. On that last night, Jesus was with, was with his disciples. That night, the night he was betrayed. On that night, Jesus gathered all of his friends in a borrowed room for one final Passover meal, one final remembrance of the way God saves his people. Only Jesus changed the story. There's a very clear and precise way of celebrating Passover. There was a script you followed closely, and probably Jesus had done that in every Passover that they had celebrated together before this. 
but not tonight. Tonight, even as he helped them remember God's action in the past, he pointed them forward toward the cross, toward his death for them and for all of us. On previous Passovers, there were probably larger groups, maybe even crowds who, who came to be with Jesus on this high and, and holy moment. But this night was different. Jesus wanted his close friends there and only them. Who would you, who would you want present if, if you knew it was your last night that you would die the next day? You'd probably want those who are closest to you, those who, who love and support and, and care for you. Your family, most likely, and maybe a few close friends who are like family to you. That's who Jesus called to himself on this night. The friends, the, the disciples who were his family. Peter, James, John, Matthew, and all the rest. Including Judas. Judas, you remember from your reading of the Gospels, is always labeled from the very beginning of the story. He's labeled as a betrayer. It's a murder mystery in which we already know the murderer before the deed ever, even takes place. But Judas is there. And from our best reconstruction of that night, he was probably sitting next to Jesus in the place of the intimate friend. In fact, during the meal, Jesus breaks off a piece of bread and he dips it in the, in the dish and he offers it to Judas. That's a Middle Eastern way of expressing deep friendship to another person. And usually when you do that, you offer the bread and you say, eat this for my sake. Can you imagine that? In the midst of Jesus telling them that they will all fall away, that one of them will betray him, Jesus reaches out and he offers friendship and love to Judas. But Judas rejects Jesus' offer. Judas prefers his own choice of deception and death to Jesus' friendship. And so Jesus turns to the rest of the disciples and offers him the bread and the cup. Eat this for my sake. Drink this for my sake. Do this and remember. Remember. I mean, it's what we do. In fact, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, much of what the Bible demands can be comprised in one word. Remember. Twenty or so years after that meal in the upper room, remembering is what those early Christians in Corinth were doing. And Paul wants this holy meal to, to not just be something they go through and, and move on. He wants it to enrich their souls. And so he gives them direction in, in the verses surrounding the ones that we read. First, he tells them to look back, not just to the upper room, but look back all the way to the original Passover itself. It's, part, it's all part of God's great drama in rescuing the human race. Of course, Jesus' sacrifice makes the Exodus look somewhat pale by comparison because Jesus is about the business of saving people not just from slavery, but from sin and death and hell, from guilt and eternal separation from God. But that began, that salvation way began all the way back in Moses' time in the Passover. Jesus is completing what was started then. And so look back with gratitude, Paul says. Give thanks that God loves us enough to rescue us, to come to us, to save us. Then look in. Paul says we shouldn't approach the table lightly. He says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Author Michael Green says that perhaps behind Paul's words here is the traditional search for leaven or, or yeast that was part of the Passover ritual. Maybe you remember when the Hebrews had to flee from Egypt, they didn't have time to let the dough rise, and so they made bread without yeast. And yeast, in their understanding, came to represent all those things in our lives, those sins, those, that stuff that just keeps coming back, just keeps rising up. You know how yeast or leaven is always swelling and you have to punch it back down. Just like that, there are some sins that keep rising up in our lives and we have to, we have to deal with them. We, we have to examine ourselves, Paul says. Look at it this way. Nobody comes to the table for dinner with dirty hands. I mean, what was your mother always telling you, right? Go wash your hands. Don't sit down at my table without clean hands. Paul says in the same way, we shouldn't come to the Lord's table until we've looked in and dealt with the sin that we find inside. This is serious business. Jesus' sacrifice calls us to deal honestly with the sin that so easily grabs onto us and snares us. But unless we, unless we become discouraged, remember again who was at that table the first night. Imperfect disciples. Squabbling over who was the greatest and which one Jesus liked more. 
In fact, if the, if the table were only open to perfect people, it would remain forever empty. And so to the best of our ability, we look in and we let Christ cleanse us of our sin. Next, look up. One time I, I, when I was uh, ask, uh, working with the children's church, I asked a group of children what communion was. And one little boy, he didn't have to think about it. He piped right up and he said, it's a snack in the middle of the service. <laughs> well, for a child, that's a pretty good understanding. But you know, if we never get beyond that, we fail to grow in our faith. This is not just a snack. It's not just an ordinary meal. This is the Lord's table. Paul tells the Corinthians, he reminds them of that over and over again. It is Christ who feeds us here. That's why it's not up to me or, or Pastor Rick or anybody in the church leadership to determine who can and who can't receive communion. Jesus welcomed all of the twelve, even Judas. We welcome all who love Christ or who want to love him. It's his body, it's his blood, it's his table, it's his supper. So look up, look toward him, look toward Jesus, and remember... And once we've looked up and we've fixed our eyes on Jesus, then look around, Paul says. This is a communal meal. It's not a solitary action. This is not about me getting my communion. This is about Jesus' family gathering around the table. Maybe there are people here tonight uh, or in this church or people you've encountered today that you just don't like or you have trouble getting along with. It's okay. You, it's okay to admit that. God's not surprised, nor is anybody else for that matter. Because the church is made of people, and people are the same now as they were then. For instance, there in the Corinthian church that Paul's talking about, there's an ongoing struggle. This is uh, far from a perfect church. There's bitterness and, uh, that has grown, and there's questions about who's on whose side. Some of them, Paul says, would arrive early, most likely the rich who had leisure time, and they could eat, they'd get to the, to the gathering early and they'd eat all the food. And then others, the slaves and the working poor, would come later and there's nothing left for them. Sort of like when you know, somebody goes first in the potluck line and takes all the food, and there's nothing for those of us who end up at the back. Paul says that won't do. Take care of one another, he says. This table is meant to bring you together. Even Jesus had told the disciples that if they came to worship and realized they had something against a brother or sister in the community, they should leave worship right then and make it right before they come to the table, before they offer their gift or they offer themselves. Look around. Look into the eyes of your brothers and sisters. Christ died for them, too. God loves them, too. They're created in the image of God. So look around and remember and then fifth is the call is to look forward. Paul says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The coming of Jesus is a great hope of the Christian. And the communion table is a foretaste of the banquet that's promised in the kingdom of God. So it is a snack. It's a foretaste. It's a glimpse of everything God has promised for us. It's, a, it's getting us ready to be in Jesus' presence. You know, the Corinthians lived in a world of political upheaval and uncertainty and economic injustice. That sounds like a familiar world to me. Does it to you? They're, they're no different from you and me. They had difficult personal circumstances as well. Their world was just like ours is. When they gathered around this table, they were grabbing on to the hope that one day all of this will be redeemed, be made new. The whole Bible is the story of that redemption. Jesus came to give his life so that we could be rescued, saved, redeemed, and more than that, so that the world could be redeemed. It doesn't look very redeemed right now. And over and over the New Testament reminds us that one day Jesus will return and he will finally defeat sin and death and the grave. He is returning. He promised us that. It may be tomorrow, it might be a thousand years from now, but he is coming. And when he comes, everything will be made right. That is the hope of the Christian. That's the hope we look forward to when we gather here at this table. In fact, at the table, everything comes together. Communion is the moment at which the past event, the crucifixion, comes forward to live again in the present. And the future moment of the Lord's return comes backwards in time to challenge us in the present. The table of the Lord ought to fill us with hope as we look forward. Finally, we look outward. 
There's that word in Paul's description, that word proclaim the Lord's death. Proclaim, it means to announce publicly. The table ought to change us. Enough so that when we leave this place, people notice there's something different about us because we've been in Jesus' presence at the table. The food provided here, Jesus' very presence, is meant to strengthen us so that we can proclaim His mercy and His grace and His love with our very lives. Communion is ascending. Michael Green puts it this way. He says, Holy Communion is battle rations for Christian warriors, not cheesecake for lazy Christians. <laughs> In fact, the next part of Paul's letter focuses on spiritual gifts. If you read on into 12 and 13 and 14, uh, spiritual gifts are those abilities God gives us to, make, to, to, to be able to make disciples of Jesus for the transformation of the world. Communion changes us. It equips us. It enables us to move outward and proclaim with our lives, our actions and our words, the salvation found in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. That was certainly true for those first Disciples gathered in that upper room. Oh, not this night. This night, they all did exactly what Jesus said they would do. They deserted him. One betrayed him blatantly and then took his own life. But they all left Jesus in one way or another in the coming hours. Peter pledged to defend him to the death, but by sunrise the next morning, he had denied Jesus three times. In the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane, they all ran away. But in the wake of that failure, and in the bright light of the resurrection, to a man, the 11 disciples all gave their lives for the sake of sharing the good news about Jesus, proclaiming his death. We've been asking the question, who is this man? He's the one who was about to give his life for them and for every person throughout all time to save us from our sins and rescue us from death. He's the one this night who's giving them and us a tang tangible way to remember his death, his sacrifice. And so every time, every time these disciples gathered at the table, they remembered and they gave thanks and they celebrated. And then they rose from the table to go proclaim his death until he comes. So I invite you then on this holy night to look back, look in, look up, look around, look forward, and look outward. Because their calling is ours as well, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks on this night for this gathering. We come to remember this evening, but not just to remember. We come to gather at your table to be transformed, to be changed, to be made more like you. And so tonight we give you thanks and we remember, as you call us to, we remember how on that last night Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he passed it among them and said, eat this for my sake, do this and remember. And after supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it among them and he said, drink this, all of you, for my sake. As often as you drink it, remember and give thanks. And so we do that tonight. We gather at your table on this night of nights to remember and to celebrate and to give thanks. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world to proclaim his death until he comes. And we'll give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus as we pray in the way that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The 
one loaf reminds us that though we're many, we're one in Christ. When we break the bread, it's a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we, over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Miss Rick and, and uh, Matt and Jamie, if you would come and join me. of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Jamie, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Matt, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. As always, it is our custom that the in the United Methodist Church that those who love Christ or who want to love Him are welcome at the table. We're going to have a station here and one at that aisle, and you're welcome to come as as you are led. I can't tell if there's yes, Ginger's here. They'll be directing you uh, to come this evening. If you'd like to kneel and pray, you're welcome to do that uh, this morning, this evening, and then return to your seats by the by the outside aisles. Let's come to the table this evening, to His table. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. We ask that you would enable us to go forth in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. There is an ancient tradition of the church that uh, on Maundy Thursday we clear the altar to prepare us for the desolation of Good Friday. So hear these words from the Gospel of Mark, to prepare us for that this evening. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard, going at once to Jesus. Judas said, Rabbi! And kissed him. The men seized Jesus, Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. The psalm says, How precious to the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. How precious is the sacrifice of Christ. He is the treasure for which everything was given. Know that you are precious to God and know that you are worthy of his sacrifice. He came for you. Remember and give thanks. Go in peace.